people's imagination live and commit their acts of bravery in our program, The Legend of Kazakhs. Legends are an invaluable cultural heritage passed down from generation to generation. It is in the culture of nutrition that a national identity of the people, their ethnic specificities, their cultural traditions and aesthetic tastes are most clearly reflected. It evolved over the centuries, reflecting the history of the Kazakh people with its traditional and unique forms of life. In the traditional diet of Kazakhs, meat was predominant in terms of milk consumption. Meat was also mainly used to purchase grain and other products in exchange for it. In most parts of Kazakhstan, a single type of farm was used, based on a combination of plowed farming with the cultivation of dairy cattle. Such a complex system of economy determined the presence of dishes made of flour and cereals, grain, meat, and dairy products. Since ancient times, Kazakhs led a nomadic way of life. They had significant influence on the preparation of such an important dish for any national cuisine, such as bread. Bread had to be prepared easily in the difficult moving conditions of nomadic life. Such bread became baursak. This is pieces of sourdough fried in fat. Moreover, the baursak was covered with oil film during frying and inside they remained soft for a long time and kept their taste. The Kazakhs always had respect for bread. It can never be thrown away. It cannot be stepped on. And if it accidentally falls to the ground, it needs to be raised and put on a table. And the name Baursak itself comes from the Kazakh words Baur Masa, Baur Lasuga, and Baur, which means striving for unification kinship and brotherhood. Over the centuries, the Kazakh people have accumulated vast experience in producing and preparing meat and dairy products. Still, the most popular products in Kazakh national cuisine was and remains on par with meat dishes from dough. And now Baursak remains the main dish of the Kazakh Dastarkhan. This is the festive and everyday bread. Each house of a Kazakh family must necessarily be filled with the smell of baursak, which the housewives have fried according to old recipes, passed down from mother to daughter, from mother-in-law to daughter-in-law. The fragrant lush golden balls, from small to large, they are served for tea and before meals, with kumus and as a snack, and for the horse broth as well. But how did Bowersock appear? Let's find out together in our legend. The boy, jumping up, walked next to his mother. He was constantly twisting his head to watch out for something out of sight. He was looking at the little white sheep grazing in the distance. Then he looked upon the stately horses stinging in the grass. He peered into the distance where the step was intersected by a blue ribbon of river and then into the hands of his mother who carefully kept the dish on which the fragrant golden bower socks were stacked. 
Mom, when we come to grandfather on the pasture, he will say to us as always, Oh, bye, here are my children. How tired you must be. Well, sit down. I'll pour for you some delicious kumus. The woman laughed and her bright black eyes narrowed. Her lips turned upward. You are right. That is exactly what he will say. And we will treat him with these bawrsak. Yes, the boy laughed. I've tried these different bawrsaks. But yours, mom, they are the most delicious. This is because you are probably the first one to think up how to prepare them. The woman continued laughing as she answered, Son, it wasn't me at all who thought about how to prepare them. Then who was it? Oh, my son, it was a long, long time ago. Tell me, mother, tell us, because we have time until we get to our grandfather. The boy begged his mother to begin. Well, well, when I was very little, my grandmother told me this story. It was getting dark. Through the whole valley, bonfires were flickering. The tired warriors fell right onto the ground and immediately fell asleep with heavy, restless sleep. For many months, there had raged a bloody battle. The Khan with his warriors slowly moved forward, pushing the enemy to the rocky mountains. The White Khan's yurt was surrounded by warlords around a low table. Their sunken, blackened, weather-beaten faces were serious, and they fervently discussed the impending offensive. Each of them proposed his plan, and their dispute did not fade until morning. One of them started to speak. We think with you from which rear to move to the enemy. We think how to protect our backside. But we have completely forgotten about the strength of our jigits. The food reserves are draining before our eyes, and soon we will have nothing to feed our batirs. When these jigits get hungry, they cannot sit in a saddle and shoot arrows accurately. Think about it. Everyone hesitated and began to look at each other. In fact, he was right. There was absolutely no stock of provisions. The Han struck the table with his fist. Everyone shuddered and fell silent. I know, the Khan began threateningly. Hunger is not our ally, and our task is to feed our soldiers. Our plan of attack is almost solved. If our decision is correct, then we will dislodge these rabid dogs from our land. We will solve this problem with food, so you must tell the cook that he needs to nourish my batters for exactly 10 days. And then we will win with a victory and turn back towards our Aouls. If he cannot do that, then I will cut off his head. And if he can, I will give him as much silver as he can carry. The brave warlords nodded. The Han's faithful servant rushed to the chief cook. He burst into his tent and woke him up. The servant gave the cook the order of the Khan. The cook shook and grabbed his head. He didn't know what to do. As soon as the sun came up, the cook and his assistants rushed to the wagon and began to get all of the supplies. Yes, he won't be able to keep his head with such scant supplies. All the cattle had already been eaten a long time ago. He had a few sacks of rice and several sacks of dried meat, a cartload of flour and dried curds. There are many warriors, and for them this will only last a couple of days. And he began to rack his brain to figure out how to stretch these meager reserves for as long as 10 days. The cook decided not to give out any daily rations to the batirs from the dried jerky meat. The cook did not close his eyes for the whole night. He thought about what to cook so that his dish would be rich and tasty. He sent some servants to the steppe to search for the necessary herbs, for tastes and aromas, and others for water. The servants put grass into the cauldron with water to the bonfires. The cook threw jerky into the boiling water and when it was boiled, the broth was gilded. He poured rice into the broth and seasoned it with fragrant herbs. 
This was a delicious and satisfying sorpa. The Han decided to try it. They brought the Han the rich soup, and from the hot, nourishing sorpa, the Han's forces multiplied. He was pleased with the cook. Again and again there were battles, and slowly the enemy retreated. For several days, the chef fed the warriors with the nourishing sorpa, but then there was no more rice left. The cook was puzzled. Now what could he cook? He didn't sleep all night, and in the morning he ordered again to put the cauldron of water on the bonfire, and then the cook decided to knead the dough. In the boiling water, again he threw jerky and thinly rolled pieces of dough. He flavored it with herbs, which gave it the taste and aroma to the dish. The soup became stuffed and delicious. The cook was able to feed all of the batirs. They brought the dish to the Khan. Again, the Khan liked the dish, and he praised the cook. For several days, he was preparing the nourishing sorpa until the jerky meat finished. The joyous messages were carried across the military camp. Today, the Han's detachment won a glorious victory. They defeated the enemy's cavalry and almost beheaded the enemy's army. But the battle was not over yet. Without meat, the Sorpa would not give strength and vigor to the warriors, and the cook knew about it. He didn't sleep all night. Only bitter thoughts came to him. This time, he would have to say goodbye to his head. In the morning, they put the cauldron on the fire. As soon as the water began to boil, the cook threw pieces of dough and herbs. In order for the sorpa to be a little nutritious, he threw into the cauldron mutton fat. The cook fed this dish to the batirs, but they were not happy with such food. They didn't like it. When the Khan himself touched the pottage, he shook his head in displeasure. It was not tasty and not satisfying. In addition, the boiled dough without meat would not give strength and vigor to the soldiers. He sent his displeasure to the cook. Sadness overcame the cook because there were only two days left. Only now he had only flour. He prepared himself for the most terrible outcome. He would be dead the next morning. As soon as the sun came up, the cook ordered the servants to put the cauldron onto the fire again. What was to be done? He made the dough not fresh but sour. Maybe this would make the dish tastier. The water began to boil, and he began to throw the dough into the water. So the cook walked around all the boiling cauldrons and thought about his unhappy fate. He approached the last kazan and stood without looking at it, and he threw a couple of pieces of dough. These bitter thoughts completely overcame him, and the fog stood before his eyes. Suddenly, the cook's sensitive nose smelled the fried dough. He came to his senses and looked at the cauldron. There was no water at all, only the remains of fat left from the sorpa. The cook waved all the negligent servants away who put the empty cauldron on the fire, and besides not washing it. The remains of fat on the walls of the cauldron melted under the hot fire. The small bubbles boiled fat in the cauldron, frying pieces of dough. This would have to be the end of the servant. But before that, the delicious aroma came from the kazan. This would have been the end of the servant. But before that, a delicious aroma came from the kazan that all the servants were nuzzling. The cook caught pieces of dough fried from all sides from the cauldron. He looked at the ruddy balls and he liked them so much that he decided to try them himself, not trusting the servant. He bit off a piece of fried dough and snapped his tongue with pleasure. They were magnificent, tender and tasty. The cook ordered to pour out the water from the cauldrons and throw in them mutton fat. They cooked a lot of fried lush golden balls the servants distributed the full trays of roasted dough, treating the warriors. The batirs exclaimed approvingly, 
trying a new, unusual dish. The Khan also tried the fancy fried balls. He took one and tried it. Oh, what a cook! Oh, what a fine fellow! The Khan exclaimed with pleasure, eating one ball after another. The Han's servant came running to the chef and shouted, Hey, Baursak, Han told you to come see him in the yurt. The cook's legs gave way. He decided that his end had come. At a slow pace, hanging his head on his chest, he approached the white yurt of the Han. He crossed the threshold of the yurt, and suddenly the Han jumped to him and embraced him. Well, Baursak, well, what a master! Well done! I've never eaten anything tastier than your fried balls, and let them be called in your honor, Baursak. A few days later, the enemy army was overpowered by the Khan. The bloody battle was over. Finally, a peaceful warm sun rose over the plain. The army moved back, returning to their native villages, and together with him there was a rumor about the Khan's cook, Baursak, and his incredibly tasty and magnificent fried balls. That's how it was. The woman finished her story and smiled at her son, who was so infatuated with the story that he didn't even notice how they had come to the pasture. But here we are, Sonny. Run up to your grandfather. The boy rushed to his grandfather, who joyfully shouted, Oh, here are my children. How tired you must be. Well, come and sit down. I'll pour for you some delicious kumus. The boy ran to his grandfather and laughing exclaimed, And we've brought you the most delicious bower socks. And I'll tell you a secret, the grandson said softly. These are probably the most delicious ones that have ever been cooked. And even tastier, the old man exclaimed, and everyone laughed. The food traditions of Kazakhs, those of pastoralists and semi-nomads, formed the basis of the Kazakh national cuisine. Many components of the traditional food system of the modern society remain in everyday life up to the present. In the diet of the national cuisine, meat dishes, sour milk products, and spices always prevailed. The Kazakh cooking traditions had a peculiar technology. The peculiarity of life has left its imprint on the ways of cooking. A large place was given to harvesting and long-term storage of products. The bread was fried most often in the form of flat cakes, and Bowersock enjoyed the most popularity of these fried goods. Now no one can even say when the Bowersock first appeared on the nomad Zastarhan. Since the Bowersock can be cooked in a cauldron on a hike, they were always a very popular dish. People prefer to cook Bowersock in round form, but this is not the only possible form. They're also triangular or square. And in antiquity, it was quite often prepared in Jol Baursak. They were ready to be hurried for those who were on the road. The dough was rolled into a long sausage. The pieces were simply torn off and thrown into boiling oil. Also from antiquity came its secret. When the Baursak was cooked only in mutton fat, this is what was covered in the thin oil film. The inside would always be soft and would keep for a long time their taste. Many traditional Kazakh dishes are known and loved by those who appreciate gourmet meals all over the world. The nutritional traditions as a cultural phenomena are directly related to the life of the people, as food and meals are often the structural components of festivals and rituals. The national cuisine 
although it has certain stabilities, is still subject to change over time. And now much more attention should be paid to the national cuisine as a symbolic symbol, as a national treasure.